Siskin. Um, I'm the author of this book, Playing Solo Jazz Piano, and this book actually has four chapters about different ballad styles in there. Um, and today, I want to focus on a ballad style called the Stop Start Rubato Ballad. And of course, I was just playing you an example of the Stop Start Rubato Ballad using the tune Days of Wine and Roses. And today, I want to break it down a little bit and show you how this style works. And in coming uh, days and weeks, I'll do other features about other kinds of ballad styles that you can experiment with. So I noticed as I was listening to various jazz pianists who inspire me, people like Oscar Peterson, Bill Evans, Mulgrew Miller, Kenny Barron, Hank Jones, Errol Garner, the list goes on and on and on and on, um, that they were playing in this style where they would play a bit of a melody, take a pause, and add in what I call commentary. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about what this commentary could be. Um, but this is the basic essence of the Stop Start Rubato Ballad. In a sense, you're going to put fermatas over certain notes. So if I'm playing the Days of Wine and Roses, there's the first two notes of the days. I might pause there and go. start rubato ballad. You know, rubato kind of means that you're taking your time, maybe you're swaying a little bit, you're adding a little bit of excel rondo here, um, you're adding a little bit of retardando over here, but this is a lot more than this. This is taking some really extended breaks to improvise, to be playful, to comment on the melody as it's happening. So let's go over a few things. Um, so first of all, let's talk about how you're going to play the melody. In this setting before we talk about all that fancy commentary that's making it really shimmer and shine. So first thing is um, usually I focus on using these uh, kind of blocked out um, shared hands voicings. I have um, a whole video and two chapters in this book about shared hands voicings, so I'm not going to cover it in depth here. But the idea of shared hands voicings means that between your two hands, you're playing about five notes, maybe six, that fill out this chord. repeating anything, I'm not playing stride, because we want to avoid keeping time here, right? If we start implying a meter, then when we get to the point where we're doing some commentary, um, then, you know, it's going to feel like a really kind of surprising interruption. So I'm doing very little in the accompaniment. I'm playing nice full voicings with lots of alterations. slightly and don't I don't want anybody getting to um, but you could you hear I separated out the bass note from the rest of the chord there that can also kind of help you reach some notes if you can't hit some of these tenths and larger intervals at once grace notes tied into the chord. So you could block them out, you could arpeggiate a little bit, you could also, it's very common in the style to play the melody in octaves and then respond with the chord. I call this kind of a call and response style. Um, whether that makes
makes any sense to you. So I'm playing the melody. It could be just separated by one octave. I think it usually brings out a little bit better if there's an octave in between. And then I'm just trying to make kind of a melodic voicing. I'm imagining that I'm a string section in an orchestra. Really listening to the top notes of these, um, trying to add some color, trying to add some momentum, some contrast. Um, and another thing that you can do, of course, is you're always welcome to reharmonize. Sometimes it's fun trying to harmonize one chord per, per melody note. Um, could be. to reharmonization. Um, there's a whole chapter in this book called Reharmonization, and I recently just put out a, a video called, I think it's called Reharmonization 101. So if you want to know a little bit more about how I do that, um, there's a lot of information out there. I'm sure I'll be sending more. So that's how you would play the melody. Now, as far as choosing where to pause, um, there's not any hard and fast rules. Of course, you're welcome to do it as you like, um, but the guidelines would probably be uh, three things that I can think of. The first is to think about um, you know, your melodic phrasing. You don't want to pause right in between, right in the middle of a melodic phrase, right? In this tune I hear. So if I went. That second one is a little weird, right? Like it just kind of breaks up the melody. So we still want to hear the melody which relates to point number two, which is that you do want to take the lyrics into consideration, right? The days of wine and roses. I'm sorry you have to hear me sing. I'm not at all a singer, but if you go the days of wine and, and then you fill, and then you say roses, that's probably weird. I wouldn't do that um, if I were singing the tune. I wouldn't do that if I were accompanying a singer. And so I wouldn't do it here. I want to play the whole phrase. <laughs> which is that in jazz, we love focusing our attention on dominant chords. Dominant chords are the ones where we can add a ton of altered chord, uh, a ton of altered tones, excuse me. Um, they're the ones, of course, that feel tense. And uh, I, I had a teacher once tell me the difference between a cocktail pianist and a jazz pianist is that a cocktail pianist does ornaments and arpeggios and all of this stuff on every chord. A jazz pianist just focuses on the dominant chords. So as you're deciding where to stop and where to elaborate on, Try to steer things towards the dominant chords. Of course, that doesn't mean that 100% of the times you stop have to be dominant chords. But if you're deciding between two places, um, I would err towards the dominant. For example, in this progression, it has an F major and then an E flat 7. So I'm probably not going to pause on the F major and then move to the E flat 7. It doesn't sound awful but it's gonna be more tasteful and more in the spirit of the music if you pause on that E flat seven. Now I'm on a D seven. So um, where you maybe have a choice or you're deciding between two spots, err on the side of moving towards dominant chords. Okay. So that's what I would do with the melody. And now comes the fun part, which is the commentary. And there's almost no limit to what you can do in terms of commentary. So don't let my, uh, my list here limit you, um, but I do wanna offer you several suggestions. And I'm gonna go in the order of what I think is kind of the least pianistically difficult to maybe more and more pianistically and musically difficult things to pull off. Um, so to start, I think bell tones um, which is what I call octaves in the upper register of the piano, are very, very um, great devices for this and very commonly used. I'll give you an example.
Okay, so it could be just one bell tone, you're just hitting up there. It could be two, it could be a whole arpeggio of bell tones. You can make little melodies. There's so much you can do. As far as choosing what notes to use as bell tones, um, the simple answer is I would choose chord tones, right? If I think I tone E flat seven, I would use a note of the E flat seven chord, so maybe the ninth or the fifth or the sharp eleven. Um, which brings me to my second, you know, guideline, which is that you want to choose colorful notes. It's not going to sound awful if you use an E flat on the E flat seven, but it's not going to be your most colorful choice, right? And in fact, I I was kind of demonstrating for a student recently and realized that I was frequently choosing notes that I didn't include in the original voicing. So, you know, for example, if I'm doing this voicing for E flat seven, it's, you know, the root, the seventh, the third, the thirteenth, and the ninth, I don't have a fifth in here. So maybe a fifth would be nice to add. That way it's a new sound that you get for a bell tone or a sharp five. And that's gonna just make it ping and make it a little bit more colorful. Okay, so bell tones, very useful, very much in this style. Um, now, your second type of commentary is also very, you know, pianistically simple, which is to put in a bass note of some kind. And it could just be that you just grab that bass note. scale down and it's always great to do something chromatic you can also use the bass to connect so here again I told you it's an F major to an E flat 7 two devices and all of the devices that I'm telling you, um, that I'm sharing with you today, uh, can be used together. And in fact, when you hear a lot of the grades, it's hard to isolate the devices um, because they go back and forth kind of between so many different ones. And of course, you know, I'm giving you a very organized list and when you actually go and listen to the grades, it's not so organized. They're such geniuses um, that they're, you know, using a wide variety of devices that probably couldn't be summarized certainly in a 20 minute video or a lifetime of study. Um, but check this out, I'm gonna use some bell tones and some bass notes, and sometimes within the same kind of fermata. So, hear it? Bell tone, bass note. Bass note, bell tone. You gotta watch both hands. style, um, it took me a long time to learn um, because you kind of have to move fast between these different things. If you take too long, um, it feels like empty space. Notice also sometimes after I play a bass note, I'm restating that chord so we can hear the bell tones against the bass note. Otherwise it might feel a little empty. I'm not sure if I can do it. Feels okay. But it's a lot nicer with a little bit more um, substantive kind of color in the middle. Okay, so we've got bass notes, we've got bell tones. Um, third device uh, is what I call octave stamping. And this is um, a pretty simple concept with a lot of possibilities. So octave stamping just means that you're going to play something and you're going to stamp it into two, three different octaves, maybe more. Um, and it could be going up, it could be going down, It's totally up to you. You could leap around. I've never tried it. Let's see. Maybe. So the simplest thing you could do is to play a two or three note just chord, or we could think of it as an interval if there's only two notes, right? Okay. And 
again, I'm selecting chord tones and I'm trying to make it on the more colorful side. So I selected the 13th and the 9th. So be the sharp 11. separate out the notes. Um, and this is great, you can use triads. Sounds like a doorbell, I know. So I'm using an F triad, it's in second inversion. So. And notice, I'm choosing the F triad over the E flat chord. I probably wouldn't use an E flat triad over the E flat chord because it's not going to be colorful, right? step into making this really colorful, we can use what I call interlocking fifths or interlocking sixths. In this case, we're going to make a four note chord with the top and bottom note generally the same, uh, but there's a bunch of variations that you could do. And now we're going to play the non-adjacent notes together. So uh, my second and fifth finger form a sixth, and then my fourth finger and my thumb form a sixth. too technically difficult, but you do have to find some nice colorful sounds in there. Now, octave stamping could be other things, you know, it could be little melodies. Right? Um, Monk does this thing, uh, like a group of five. And at a certain point, an octave stamping kind of starts sounding very similar to an arpeggio, potentially. Um, or, you know, for those of you who watch my video about Oscar Peterson's licks, a lot of them we could call octave stamping. There, there's two things to the octave. Right? So, um, you know, maybe it's double octave stamping, or it's just a more complex kind of octave stamp, or... Um, that I gave you, come up with your own version. It could be outer notes to inner notes. But just anything, get used to playing it multiple times um, in different octaves um, because it's a great device to keep some momentum going, add a bunch of color, make it more orchestral without actually being that technically difficult. Okay, so um, we've got bell tones, we've got bass fills, we've got octave stamping of all varieties. Um, the next thing I want to suggest is adding in chord progressions. Um, and probably the, the easiest thing to do would be to add in extra 2-5-1s or dominant chords moving through the circle of fifths. So here I'm going to really think about aiming for the next thing. You know, if I want to pause, the next chord is a D7, so I could make a nice 2-5-1. G minor. So I'm going to go way 
way around the circle of fifths. Totally forgot what, what I was aiming for, but I saved it. <laughs> um, so I'm adding in dominant chords around the circle of fifths. Look at Hank Jones, for instance, doing this all the time. Um, you know, and there's so many creative ways to do it. Like if I'm aiming for this D, I could do. sixth away it's a full measure um, so if I'm aiming for B flat and I want a full measure's worth of circle of fifths I start on G flat and minor sixth away I did that really poorly how am I doing this so badly but if I just want to get to F Three beats, then I'll start on D, a tritone away. Hear the, hear the progression? So I'm adding in kind of these leading chords. You know, and it could be circle of fists, it could be half steps. Jones, again, loves to take, you know, if he's on a major chord, he'll take that major triad, F major, move it to G flat major, move it to A flat major, and then bring it back. So, you know, you can do something with the harmony in there instead of doing something that just kind of fills the uh, pianistic and melodic space. Which brings us to scales and arpeggios. Um, you know, there's no denying when you listen to the great virtuosos, the Oscar Petersons, the Art Tatums, that there's a ton of scales and arpeggios. Um, and again, usually these are going to be scales and arpeggios for the dominant chords. Um, it doesn't really, like, it's, it doesn't feel good to play an F major scale. Like, it just doesn't add anything. Um, so I would really wait for the dominant chords, especially on your scales, and I would use your symmetrical scales. By which I mean whole tone, and you'll certainly hear Monk do that all the time, and octatonic are probably the two big ones. It took me a long time to learn this, uh, so it might be very obvious to a lot of you, but it wasn't to me when I was <laughs> when I was learning, which is that the most important part of a scale is um, the end. It's sticking the landing somewhere. So you notice as I play the scale, see this note but I'm finishing it off with a bass note I have my left hand just ready you know it's like doing a gymnastics routine and then you have to stick the landing <laughs> I totally didn't stick the landing you gotta aim somewhere with your scales if you just play it doesn't sound like anything so it has to lead into the next chord to the next melody note. There's a little arpeggio. Notice again, my right hand's doing the arpeggio. The left hand finishes it off. I do more arpeggios going down because I want to be able to finish them with the left hand with a bass note. Um, I'm capable of doing arpeggios going up. But it doesn't have the same effect as. And notice what I'm doing, it's, it's hopefully somewhat slick, which is that I'm doing the right hand scale and then I'm doing a little bass lead in, like I taught you kind of as a second thing. I'm doing. So it sounds like. 
ornament at the end of of the uh, arpeggio that just makes it sparkle a little bit more. You know, it's like that gymnastics landing um, where you kind of pause and, and celebrate. <laughs> They can be lingering, they can have a personality. <laughs> Scale, bell tones, bass note. <laughs> you can also use your chromatic scale, especially to lead to a melody. Peterson, um, which is what I call putting a curl in a scale. Um, and so that means that you're taking, taking, you're not just going straight up, but you're, um, you're kind of ducking back and changing direction. And there's a million different ways to do it. Right now, what I'm just doing, I'm doing a whole octave going down by a third. That's certainly something that I just completely stole from Oscar Peterson, and I'm not ashamed to say it because he's great. Um, so you can put a curl in those scales. Um, what am I missing? Uh, so arpeggios are another big option. Um, and when I say arpeggios, you certainly you really don't want to do an arpeggio like starting on the tonic. You know, it doesn't sound like jazz. <laughs> you know, if I do a triad arpeggio or even a seventh chord arpeggio, it's just not colorful enough. So uh, I would avoid the root mostly, and I would think again about mixing some color tones, altered tones, if you're in a dominant chord, with some of the essential chord tones. So here I'm again on this, I'm on this E flat seven, and maybe I'll take the third, the sharp eleven, the seven, and the root. I just told you to avoid the root. traditional arpeggios that I'm playing. It's no form of... It just doesn't sound very colorful. Um, I'll give you another example. How about for the, for the D7, I could basically do an A flat dominant arpeggio. For the G minor, maybe I'll choose the major chord. Um, I might try to put a little curl at the end of this. Um, a lot of the greats started or ended their arpeggios with something like that. So if you're trying to sound like Artatum, good luck first of all, um, but put, put a little ornament to the top of your arpeggio. to avoid any kind of a root position arpeggio. I think uh, that's really probably not going to be the sound that you're going for if you're really trying to play in a jazz style. Um, add some ornaments to the top, add some bass notes to the bottom. Um, I think you got all kinds of possibilities. Um, I'll give you one kind of last type of commentary. There is even more than this in the book, but this is now over a half hour video, so I uh, am impressed. If you've, uh, if you've made it this far. If you made it this far, comment with the word pineapple. Let's see how many people uh, actually made it. Um, so the last thing is that you could just improvise in some of these spaces. You know, take it as a moment to be a solo section.
are doing you know goes a, a level beyond that and I have nothing but uh, respect and admiration um, if you enjoyed this video boy are you gonna love this book I love it when people buy it off of my site because I get to keep more money um, than not give uh, not give a bunch of money to amazon.com as much as I appreciate them selling my book so uh, stay tuned for more descriptions of ballad styles and uh, I really appreciate like subscribes comments it all helps to make me super famous like I am today all right, see you later, everybody.